Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. How y'all doing? Hey, can we say thanks to Tim Shepard for last night? What a word, our student ministries, Pastor Tim. And tonight we have such a great night ahead. We've got uh, some special treats, some, some uh, surprises in store, but we've got the David Perkins in the house. 20 years ago started Desperation Conference. He and his family are here. And so come ready and expectant tonight. David, we bless you, we honor you. Thank you for your investment in this place for two decades. Now this morning what we're gonna do is we're going to talk about God is good. In every session of this conference, the sentence stem is God is dot, dot, dot. Pastor Tim last night talked about God is capital I. He just is. And this morning we're going to talk about God is good. So what I want you to do uh, for our text this morning is pray this out loud with me. It's one verse, Psalm 107, verse one. And I want us to pray this together three times, okay? So we'll say it three times in succession. And I want it to be your prayer and then I'll jump in and pray. So let's pray this word of the Lord together from Psalm 107 saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Now a little bit louder. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Last time, just a little bit louder. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. If we're here to be entertained, we're wasting our time. Lord, we're here because we believe that you are the God who from of old has been the speaking God. And so we ask, do it again. Say, let there be light all over again with us today. We carry in so much darkness. We carry in so much confusion. We carry in so much chaos. We have questions about the future and we need you to say, let there be light. So we invite you, spirit of the living God. Would you call my holy adrenaline? <laughs> Lord, settle me down. May I decrease and you increase. And we pray, Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. And we pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Today is a really special day for me and for my wife, Lisa, and for our kids. 16 years ago today, we put everything we had in a little Penske truck in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I just graduated from Oral Roberts University and Lisa and I got married July 1st, 05. And July 14th, we'd just gotten back from a little honeymoon. We closed the yellow door on the back of the small Penske and we just had like, just a bunch of trash sacks full of clothes. We didn't really have anything. Uh, we were married and we started driving across Oklahoma and then Kansas and then uh, went, went west and started coming to Colorado. And we pulled into Colorado Springs today, 16 years ago. Today begins my 17th year here. And, and when I think about, I was looking back through photo albums last night. We actually pulled out the old photo albums. I don't know if any of you know this, but we used to like print pictures off. And so Lisa and I were looking back through and we were newly married and we didn't have children and we pulled into this little apartment. We had one car, we had uh, uh, a job. She was a teacher here at the Classical Academy and I was working here at New Life Church and, and this little apartment, we were so happy. And, and when I was looking back through those pictures, I can summarize that season of my life by just saying simply like, God is good. It, it was just beautiful to be simple and to be in this new adventure called Colorado Springs and New Life Church and, and life was flourishing here and, and, and I, we had one car, I would drive Lisa to work as a school teacher at six o'clock and drop her off and then I would come up to the church and go to the World Prayer Center and pray and then I would work and then I would go pick her up and we'd go home and we'd make dinner together and we'd go to the gym and just all the stuff and God is good when I think back about that season and life was flourishing here at New 
Life Church, getting to run around with these folks and, and do this meaningful work. And our church at that season, if you were around, it was just on top of the world. I mean, we were knocking it down. We were making albums and, and doing these conferences and, and people wanted to talk to us. Our senior pastor was in a, in a really uh, leadership position in the United States and, and news cameras would come out and say, what does the church think about this? And what do evangelicals think about that? And Mel Gibson flew on a private plane to New Life Church to release the passion of the Christ. And there were 3,000 pastors here. And it was so intoxicating. God is good. It was so much fun. And President George W. Bush, some of you weren't even born when he was president. And that depresses me. <laughs> George W. Bush, you should read about him. He's a historical figure in the United States of America. Some of you are like, oh, who? And he, he Skyped into our pastor's conference and, and was joking around. with. It was just so much fun. God is good. When I think about that early formational time, in my tenure here at New Life, God is good. And then things shifted. We entered into so much pain. We, we lost our senior pastor and, and we were heartbroken. And, and there was just, if you know, you know, the difficulty of that season and the questions. And, and there was an economic recession in our nation and we lost about 30% of our church and about 45% of our giving. And so we had to lay off 44 staff overnight and we were heartbroken to see our friends go and, and we had come on top of the world and here we are poof, bottomed out in the valley of the shadow of death. And, and we were hoping that we would fear no evil, but we were unsure in the moment. And then we had violence on our campus. Someone came on our campus and killed two teenage girls. And we were just heartbroken. What in the world is going on? And, and I want to just suggest to you that it's easy to say God is good when life is good. The question is, will we believe that God is good when life gets bad? It's really when you're on top of the mountain and everything's working and the wind is at your back and everything you're touching is turning to gold and everywhere you go, you feel blessed and highly favored and the red carpet is rolling out in front of you. It's easy to go, praise the Lord, <laughs> when life is good. But the question is, will we believe and will we hold on to the truth that God is good when life gets bad? Have you ever had life fall apart? on you. Maybe your parents went through a difficult time and went through a divorce, maybe bullying at school, maybe there's financial pressure in your family. It's easy to believe God is good when things are working, but have you ever had life bottom out? And the enemy in this season, in, the, in those moments, threatens you and tightens the screws and presses in and wants to steal from you that bedrock truth that God is good. We see this at the very beginning of scripture. It, this is a lie as old as time that in these seasons, the enemy comes to us and starts to plant these seeds of mistrust that God is malevolent, that God is evil, that God w wishes your harm, that God is trying to mess with you and play with your emotions, that God is the God who sets you up beautifully, but then pulls out the rug from underneath you and watches all the cards tumble and then laughs at it. This is what the enemy says. Genesis chapter three, in the beginning, you know, one and two, God's making and it's good and it's beautiful, but Genesis three, the, the enemy slithers up with this seductive lie and the essence of Satan's first lie in the garden is God doesn't have your best interest in mind. He's holding out, did God really say, give me a break. He's just scared, he, he's scared of losing his monopoly. He knows that if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you'll become like him and he'll be threatened and he won't have a corner on the market anymore. And God is just trying to make your life miserable and God is just dangling the carrot in front of you and God is trying to protect his own strength. God doesn't really want you flourishing. God doesn't really love you. You're just another cog in his wheel. This is what the enemy says to us. God does not have your best interest in mind, so take the story into your own hand and, and, and write your own truth. This is what the enemy tells us. The essence of the first lie is God doesn't have your best interest in mind and the people of God had just started leaving Egypt. Finally, you know the story, they were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years and Pharaoh, more bricks and less straw and he's whipping them and enslaving them and, and making them build his world economy with cheap and free labor and finally God says, let my people go through the prophet Moses and, and, and Pharaoh after 10 plagues goes, just get out. 
go. And so they, they can't believe it. And they, they pack their bags and they start running and they're heading toward the Red Sea. They're just going out into the wilderness. They don't know where they're going. They're following the Lord. Just get out of Egypt. And finally they get to the Red Sea and they come up to the edge and they realize that they've come to the end of their own agency. They've come to the end of their own story. And then they get out and to the wilderness, God provides a way. He splits the sea and they walk right through on dry ground and they praise the Lord. But in Exodus 14, it says, as Pharaoh approached the Israelites, he's changed his mind. He's getting ready to go take back his free labor because the economy is tanking. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, they looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them and the dust cloud coming after them to bring them back into their slavery. And they were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? The enemy slithers up to these people out in the hot wilderness and goes, God does not have your best interest in mind. He's trying to make you more miserable than in Egypt. He's trying to do you the disservice of killing you out in the desert where there are no graves. And and they start doubting the goodness of God. Friends, the enemy wants to steal that greatest truth about God's goodness and place mistrust in our souls, in our minds. God is bad, God is against you. God is bad, God is against you. God is bad, God is against you. And A.W. Tozer in his famous book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. David Perkins taught me that. He, He put that book in my hands 15 years ago. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Understand this, and the scripture realizes that that's true, and so the scriptures keep coming at us. God is good, and God is good. And God is good and his mercy endures forever. And even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is good and his mercy endures forever. And even when the bottom falls out, God is good. And when that snake slithers up to you with that seductive lie, trying to teach you that God doesn't have your best interest in mind, rebuke him and cast him out because God is good and his mercy endures forever. And he will lead you into paths of righteousness understand that what comes into our minds, if we think at bedrock that God is seditious and dark and that God is uh, untrustworthy and that God is trying to play with our emotions, then the enemy has us in his clutches. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. And so the psalmist comes in Psalm 34, 8 to tell us the truth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Oh, taste and see. Like, come, come, come to the table and eat and, and trust God. He's good. Psalm 31, 19. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good and his loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 107, what we prayed today, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his love endures forever. So I wanna ask the question, in what ways is God good? If the psalmist keeps telling us and all throughout scripture we see God is good, let's, let's just kind of tease out the story of faith. In what ways is God good? I'll say to you first that God is good in creation. Like Genesis 1, seven times, and God saw that it was good. Light from darkness and, and land springing up out of the abysmal chaos of, of the deep, the primordial waters and, and trees and herbs and animals and the garden, it's flourishing and it's good. And, and I just wanna ask you, God is good in creation. Like, have you ever seen a sunrise that just, what, holy ground. Have you ever stood by the side of the ocean and the water's lapping up against your feet and on the, on the western horizon you see the sun going down into the water and you just go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Have you ever eaten a kiwi? <laughs> Like, have you ever tasted pineapple? Have you ever seen an eagle darting out of the sky at 150 miles an hour and snatching a trout with those talons and flying up into a tree and feeding its young? Have you ever seen this morning, no lie, I was driving into work, I live out in the country, and I was driving into the work, I've never seen this in my life. And so I'm just telling you, keep your eyes open because you'll see some crazy stuff. Creation is good. I, I'm, I'm wa- and I see a llama on the side of the road with a leash on it 
with a 70-year-old woman holding the leash. A 70-year-old woman was walking a llama this morning. Have you ever paid attention to how good creation is? It's an eight-foot tall, clunky thing with its neck everywhere, and this old woman just said, God is good and his mercy endures forever. It's unbelievable, like pay attention. God is good in creation. Have you ever held a newborn child and just gone, how in the world could God be so good? Have you ever sat by the bedside of an aging grandparent and, and they're rubbing your arm, honey, I love you, and you just think, could it be any better? That, like God is good and he's good in creation, number one. God is good, number two, in election. Now, some of you will think, what is it? That's like God predetermined that some people would be saved and that some people are eternally damned. No, that's not good. Election just means that God wants you on his team. That God has, has ordained you to be into his family. That God has loved you with an everlasting love. And he's written his name, uh, your name on his palm. And he's written his name on your heart. And from of old, he's been wooing you by his spirit. I love you. I bless you. This is my daughter whom I love. And her I am well pleased. This is my son whom I love. What, what the father said over the son at Jesus' baptism, God has from of old been saying that over you. God has called you. He wants you. He chose you. He elected you. He, you are in his family. If you will just say yes, everything is yours. God is good in creation. God is good in election. God is good, number three, in instruction. The ancient Israelites would pray, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And how can a young person keep their way pure? By hiding the word of God in their hearts. And, and, and the people of God meditate on the word day and night and become like trees. And Moses says, I've set before you today life and death, blessing and cursing. Like you get to pick, but choose life. If you'll follow God's way, this will be the good Life. Lisa read it to me this morning at 5.30 in bed. Matthew 7, Jesus says, look, blessed is the one, wise is the one who builds their life on the rock. And the fool builds it on sand. And the wind and the storm, it attacks both houses, but one of them gets washed away and the other one is standing. If you will build your life on the instruction of God, his instruction will be for you a bolstering and a stalwart. Your life will not get swept away in the madness if you'll just receive his instruction. God is good in creation. God is good in election. God is good in instruction. And God is good in provision. Dear God, have mercy. You read the stories of the Israelites wandering through the wilderness for 40 years, and it says that their shoes and their clothes did not wear out. What? I've been under the hot Middle Eastern sun. I've been out there with Bedouin shepherds, and I, I mean, like, you can take a couple days of it, 40 years, and they somehow made it. There's manna on the ground and quail coming in and there's water gushing out of the rock. Like only God could do this. And I remember being in high school, your age, 15 years old, and my parents had met a really difficult time financially. My sisters, twin sisters were 17. My little sister was 10, four kids. And they're praying, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. The bottom had fallen out by no fault of their own. And all of a sudden, one day we get a knock on our front door and my parents go to the front door and there's a man standing there who I've known my whole life. His grandkids are in this room today. And he said, I've been in prayer the last couple of days and I just cannot get you out of my mind. I just, I, I go to get on my knees and all I see is the growthy family. And so he said, here you go, God bless you. And he walked away from the door and we opened up the envelope and there was six months of our mortgage paid for right there. Like God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And there will be so many moments where you pray, Lord, give us this day. And you mean it literally. And you don't know where the next check is going to come from. And you don't know if you're going to get any scholarship. And you don't know if you're going to get married with $100,000 debt. And the enemy wants you to mistrust God's goodness and start to plant the seed that God does not have your best interest in mind. But I, I promise you, I promise you, I almost said I swear, but we don't swear. I promise you. 
that God will provide for you if you will just trust him, if you will just wait on the Lord and be strong and take heart and wait on the Lord and watch him, God will be your provider. He's good in creation. He's good in election. He's good in instruction. He's good in provision. And he's good at salvation. And Pastor David's gonna talk about the love of Jesus tonight. And Jesus is our salvation. God does not leave us in our sin. God does not leave us in our, in our lowly estate. He comes rushing at us and he saves us. And finally, God is good in redemption. There will be no more funerals and there will be no more hospitals and there will be no more first responders when the kingdom has fully come. Why? Because death will be defeated and suffering and mourning and tears and all of that will be washed away. God is good in all of these areas. So keep your eyes open and understand the goodness of God. And I'll say it this way. We have to reclaim the goodness of God as the bedrock of our imagination. We have to reclaim it. We have to settle into it. We have to fight for it. And I do love sitting with old people. You know why? Because old people can tell you lots of stories of the goodness of God. Honey, I I remember, talk to people with, who lived through the Great Depression. And I, Jason Jackson's in the place today. His, his grand, great grandma, Cora, she told him that the Great Depression was the greatest season of her life as an adult. She lived to be 107. And he said, Grandma Cora, what, what was the greatest season of your life? And she said, the greatest season of my life, bar none, was the Great Depression. Why? Because of the simplicity and the community and the joy. What? You read the history books and it doesn't sound like simplicity, community, and joy. And she said, in the Great Depression, we actually had to live like Christians. We had to take care of each other. We had to open our hearts and open our homes and open our refrigerators. We just, we're, if we're gonna make it, we're gonna make it together. When you sit with someone who has lived long, a long life of trusting in God, they can tell you their stories, reflecting on his faithfulness. He met me in that moment and then he met me in that moment and then he met me in that moment and somehow I've come to the end and God is good. We have to reclaim the goodness of God as the bedrock of our imagination. And that's just what I want you to hear today. That the life of faith requires patience. You're young. Please listen to an old 38 year old. I'm bald, I can tell you some things. I have kids, I've got a mortgage, I've lived a little bit of life. And listen to me, we live in an instant society where we think we can drop ship the goodness of God to our front door in less than two days. Where we think we can turn it around. My kids, they order something. My, my little nine-year-old, he's here. He's here illegally in the room today. I have two kids who are here legally and my third is here illegally. And, and he ordered an RC car, you know, remote control. He was so excited about it. He re- ordered it on Monday and at like 9 a.m., Monday at 11. Is it here? Oh, my life. Like, slow down, people. Let the goodness of God develop over the long years. I'll say it this way. Learn to play the long game with the goodness of God. The lies of the devil come at us quickly, but the goodness of God is revealed over the decades. So let it unfold and let it mature and let it develop and learn to wait on the Lord and learn to fast and pray and learn to be patient and trust that actually in those seasons where God seems like he's ignoring you, where where it hasn't happened, God is developing deep character in you that will carry you for the long haul. Trust God that when when he's pressing pause on something is not because he's against you but it's because he's for you becoming something more learn to wait for the the faithfulness of God the goodness of God over the long decades I told you about New Life Church at the beginning when we were on top of the world and then the bottom fell out but here we are 15 years later and I can tell you some follow-up stories to that when you watch and wait and pray for and, and, and expect and just hope for and trust and then fast and then kind of walk away from it and then come back and go, God, will you be good? Will you ever have mercy on us again? Watch what God does in just 15 years of waiting. We have seven new congregations in Colorado Springs. 15 years later, flourishing. We've got Nueva Vida, our Spanish-speaking congregation in the southeast side. Nueva Vida, what's up? Dios te bendiga. Yay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. 
That's about all I know. Um, <laughs> just killing it down there. They are feeding the poor and they're clothing those people who need new clothing and they're giving education to people who don't have anyone standing up for them and they're helping people get their GEDs. This congregation is changing the city for the glory of God. 15 years ago, we wondered if anything would ever happen good again and here we look up and we've got this new family in our congregation crushing it. Give it up for Nueva Vida today. If you will wait for the goodness of God and if you will just trust him over the long haul, you'll look up and you'll see the goodness of God. We've planted congregations out of this church and, and David Perkins is crushing it in Kansas City with Radiant Church and he left, he heard the call of God to go plant and to take new ground for the kingdom and we're seeing churches all over this nation pop up and the kingdom of God is violently advancing and taking back darkness for light. Brothers and sisters, we had no idea that that could happen again 15 years ago but if you will wait for the goodness of God, you will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. We've got a women's clinic here in town. Pastor Brady and the elders a decade ago felt the tug that they heard these stories about single moms and their children sleeping in cars at night and, and there are people, women in our city who are uninsured or underinsured and they can't get simple medical care and now they can go into the Dream Center's women's clinic and they can get state-of-the-art medical care, they can get chiropractic, they can get dental, they can get counseling, they can get their, their teeth taken care of. Like brothers and sisters, we didn't think that that was possible 15 years ago when we had crashed into the valley of the shadow of death but if you will just wait and be patient and trust the goodness of God, you'll look up 15 years later and you'll see the kingdom of God advancing. We've got Mary's home in our city. Mary's home. We bought an apartment complex at, at, at airport and academy that was a absolutely just jacked up and dilapidated and, and it was a meth house and we gutted it and took it down to the studs and, and uh, mitigated all of the asbestos in it. We cleaned that place up and it's the most beautiful apartment complex down at air, airport and academy and we've got 18 moms and their children sleeping in that place every night for free, living there, getting their education, getting their lives back together. This was not in our minds 15 years ago. We didn't think that any of that would ever be possible again because why? The enemy comes and says your life is closing in on you and God doesn't want you to be good and God doesn't want to provide for you but if you will just break through that lie and go for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever and though it feels like heck right now and though I'm tempted to, to doubt his goodness for the Lord is good he did it for Israel and he did it for Mary and he did it for Paul and he did it for so and he'll do it for us Again, so I'm asking you today to settle in to the long, slow play of the goodness of God. I have three kids. And I love chasing my kids through the house. One of our favorite things, they'll flip out all the lights. Dark of night. They'll go, can we play hide and seek? I say, sure. And Lisa will go hide and she's terrible. She's always got a leg hanging out or something. It's like she wants to be caught. But the kids, I mean, they're crawling in laundry baskets and they're tucking in the, the washer and dryer and, and it's pitch black. And I play this game with a smile on my face because at this point in my life, I always win. There's gonna be a day where they get me and they're stronger than me and they're pinning me down and I'm tapping out. But right now I'm enjoying it while I can. I always win this game. I find them and tickle them and yell and scream and I run real loud, stomp through the house and they're all just, just bellowing in laughter. It's, it's one of the great things that we do in our house. Remember that famous passage in Psalm 23? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me and your rod and your staff, they, they comfort me and you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. And Psalm 23 verse six, please, 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 please don't ever forget this. Tattoo it on your soul. Surely goodness, surely goodness, surely goodness, surely goodness. Surely God's goodness and God's mercy shall, everyone say, follow me. 
follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That word there, follow me, is, is the Hebrew word radaf, which means to chase down, to pursue. This is military language. And why did David use the word radaf? Because when David used this word, he was out in the wilderness hiding from Saul, who was chasing him down with a spear trying to kill him. Saul is on the hunt, trying to be malevolent, trying to be dark, trying to pin David to the wall, trying to secure a monopoly on his own kingdom. Saul, his big footsteps were not playful footsteps of a father trying to just tickle his children, have a great time. Saul wanted David dead and David's hiding in a cave, writing this out. Surely God's goodness and God's mercy will redoff me. It will pursue me, it will chase me down. Saul's military out there is secondary to God's militant determination to, to chase me down with his goodness and mercy. It will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And just like I always win with my kids right now, God will always win with you. He will always win with you. His goodness and his mercy will always win with you. God's goodness is coming. God's goodness is coming. God's goodness is coming. And when you're loving life and when life is working and when you're peaked out on the mountain, God's goodness is coming. Enjoy it, baby. And when you crash into the various valleys of the shadow of death, and I say plural, valleys, there will be moments, different seasons of your life. You live long enough and you will walk through multiple valleys of the shadow of death. And when you do, I say to you, God's goodness is coming. God's goodness is coming. God's goodness is coming. He will redoff you. He will chase you down. He will pursue you. And God's goodness will always win in your life. Can you say amen today? Would you stand with me, church? Stand with me, Desperation Conference. I had this really strong sense, really strong sense, that some of you were ready to quit. I'm not talking about on life, though. If that's you, listen. I'm just talking about on this faith thing. The enemy has slithered up to you with this seductive lie and he's tried to plant the seeds of mistrust. God does not have your best interest in mind. So go start building your own life now. No time like the present. And I'm here to rebuke that lie today in Jesus' name. You will never get a better deal than God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You will never, the enemy, the enemy will redoff you, chase you down to try to destroy you. God will chase you down to make life good for you. God will chase you down when you chase away from him. When you, when you run away from him, he'll get you back to bring you into his fold of goodness. And today, I'm here to call you back in. I'm here to say to you, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. I'm here to say to you today, Psalm 34, 8, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Those who look to the Lord, they're radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. Like, just stay with Jesus and you'll make it into the goodness of God. So will you open your hands today? Father, I pray for every single one in this place today that everyone here would be claimed by the goodness of God and they'd never get over it. <laughs> no one going out into the far country and squandering their lives, people staying home in the middle of the goodness of God. Lord, I thank you that this, this group, Desperation 2021, everyone in this place for the future, they're marked by the goodness of God and they'll learn to wait for the goodness of God in the long seasons of difficulty and they'll trust the goodness of God. When the enemy slithers up, I pray that they would say, get thee behind me, Satan when those lies come, that they would rebuke it and cast it out. And Lord, I pray for them, surely your goodness and your mercy would follow them all the days of their lives and that they would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, let's worship the Lord together.